Let's move to the second session of the of the day. It's about procedural imaging with you know some case illustrations. I think that you know the first block was really good because we had a lot of time to discuss. So I think that we should do exactly exactly the same. So do the presentations and then have time to to discuss openly discussion. So um, we will start um, with the first session that it's done by will be done by Nina. Um, standard um, TE will remain the best imaging modality. Uh, thank you very much. My, I mean, we heard a lot about uh, TE pre-planning and uh, now I think it's time to go into the procedure. And uh, my task today is to uh, speak a word for the standard TE that it is, at least at the moment, and might remain over at least a couple of years, uh, the best imaging modality to guide our procedures. Um, so why do I think that TE is the gold standard at the moment? So we have a methodology which is available everywhere. I'm pretty sure everybody here uh, in the room has a TOE probe, a standard TE probe. So the imaging approach we are using during the procedures, it's quite standardized. So we have unlimited and quick maneuverability, and we might have a look if this is something which is useful. Usually we don't need general anesthesia, so I'm from Germany, so the patients in Germany usually can swallow a probe under a sedation, this is possible. <laughs> And uh, um, there is, in, in many cases, there's no need for a contrast injection. And I think it's the most cost-saving imaging modality we have at the moment. And we already have spoken about costs, though this is an issue. So it's available everywhere. So we don't have to talk about this point because we've seen, Philip, your uh, survey. So TE is used in 90% of the patients. So it's uh, available everywhere. So the imaging approach is, uh, is pretty much standardized for LIA closure. So we have a couple of papers where you can have a look in where uh, the image approach is described. And just to give you an impression, so what do we have to do? We exclude thrombi and contraindication before the procedure. We have to understand the 3D morphology of the left atrial appendage. We have to perform a correct sizing. We guide transeptal puncture. Then you have to guide the introduction of the delivery system. You guide the device deployment. And then you check the release criteria if it's a safe position and coverage is adequate, and then you guide the device release and you recheck the final position of your device. And of course, you always have to do active imaging to monitor for complications. So just to give you an idea, so these would be some examples, a rheumatic mitral valve stenosis or a, back, a mechanical valve where it wouldn't make too much sense to implant an occluder. And uh, this is also something which would uh, uh, maybe not permit a procedure as first line. So if you have thrombus in the left atrial appendage, and I don't know if I have a pointer, but the image on the on the uh, lower bottom on the right side, this is a thrombus which formed in the left atrial pouch of an intraatrial septum. So this is something you shouldn't overlook. Also, the characterization of the left atrial appendage is quite standardized. So if you use two-dimensional imaging, which, which is not very frequent, I think, at the moment, you should at least have a look in different angulations. Uh, much easier to uh, characterize the left atrial anatomy if you have X-plane imaging. Um, you get anatomical orientation if you take a short axis view where you get the orientation in medial and lateral orientation and an X-plane which gives you the 90 degree view in the anterior and posterior direction. So it's also not unimportant to look at surrounding structures. So for example, on the left side, you see an example where we have an interposition of the pulmonary artery in between the left atrial appendage and the order. You might have a close relationship to the circumflex artery. Um, so to my experience, so I never had uh, a case where I saw a compression um, of the uh, circumflex artery, but uh, you should aware, you should be aware of where um, this is positioned and also the relationship to the left upper pulmonary vein. So um, this is something which might be of interest, and this is something we talked about. So if we could um, anticipate the transeptal puncture side. So um, I think it's important, and this is a wide-angle acquisition, which, which gives you this information, how 
the interatal septum is orientated and where the entrance and the main axis of the left atrial appendage is leading to. So this is wide angle acquisition. You can get an idea where to puncture. If the interatrial septum is very far anterior, this can be, and the origination of the left atrial appendage is also in a very anterior position, this would give you a 90 degree angle, uh, which is very uh, difficult to cross. Another important point is to characterize the ostium and the shape of the dynamics. So we know that uh, uh, the rate of embolization or the risk of embolization might be a little bit higher if you have a patient in sinus rhythm where you have more contractility. And on the other hand, if you have a very eccentric um, uh, landing zone and ostium, so you might think about your strategy, how to um, size your device. So I think there's pretty much consensus that uh, the sizing is usually done with a 3D method. So we have pretty good comparable results. Um, if you look at 3D T and CT, CT usually sizes a little bit larger, but uh, in general we have quite a good consensus if you use a 3D modality uh, for your sizing. For um, the transeptal puncture, uh, we usually use explain where you get orientation in posterior and anterior and inferior and superior uh, direction. So the next step we have to guide is a wire in the SVC. Then we have to look for the correct puncture side um, in the interatrial septum, which is usually, as we heard, um, more on in the inferior part of the septum. And this is something you can also check with a long axis view, for example, at 90 degree, where you have the septum and the uh, longest orientation of the left atrial appendage. This can give you a hint where in the septum inferior or superior might be better for your, um, for your transeptal puncture site, whereas the anterior posterior puncture site in my eyes is easier accessible if you look at a wide angle acquisition and look at the position of your interatrial septum and the entrance um, of um, um, the atrial, left atrial appendage. So the next step we have to guide, and here the axis you can see, well, this puncture site was maybe a little bit too much anterior here in the septum, but um, as we already heard um, already, so some of the devices are more forgivable. You have sheaths which can correct that a little bit. So if I look at this image um, on the left side, it might have been a little bit easier to get more coaxial axis if this transeptal puncture would have been a little bit further posterior uh, in this specific case. So then we uh, see the wire position in the left upper permanent vein, as you see on the right side, the um, introduction of the sheath. And this can also be, uh, be corrected by x imaging, as you can see on the right-hand side. So this position of the sheath might be a little bit more uh, towards the posterior side. Usually you go for uh, a lobe which is more in the anterior direction. This would mean in this case you have to uh, position your sheath a little bit more to the anterior wall, which makes it, uh, in the most cases, easier to align your device. Then you deploy the device. You have to look if you have carefully, if you have any leaks, if you uh, are in a good position. You look, and this is an example of a watchman occluder. You have specific device release criteria for each of the devices. So here you look if you have a good position, is the anchoring stable, you do some pull tests. Um, you have to look if you um, uh, choose the adequate size, if you have some compression, and uh, importantly, if you don't have any paralabular leaks. Um, the next thing is the final assessment. So after device release, sometimes you see a small tilting of the device um, after releasing the device, so you should recheck everything again um, if the device still is in a good position. So this is very much standardized, and uh, um, so what is uh, the advantage of a TOE during this procedure? So for example, you have unlimited and quick maneuverability. Is this something which is variable? And I think yes, because, um, okay, this is not proceeding anymore. Does this thing have a battery, and the battery is uh, going out of... Uh, Press. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you see a mini TE probe from GE, and uh, if you look at the wheels, you will realize that one wheel is missing, and this is a small wheel which derogates the probe in the right and left orientation. So you have anterior and posterior rotation, but what is missing is right to left. And this limits you a little bit. I don't think it's too much important uh, during a left atrial appendage uh, occlusion procedure, but if you do a mitral procedure, for example, or a tricuspid uh, procedure, it might be very important because you usually use um, uh, the right flexion to position yourself and to align yourself a little bit better over the mitral and the tricuspid valve. 
On the right-hand side, you see an example of a nice probe, and I think the image quality is getting better and better. But if you position your probe-like example here, and you focus on the left atrial appendage, you don't necessarily see the entire course of your delivery sheets. You can't assess if you have formation of any thrombotic material along the way, which is much easier, because uh, with ice you have to reposition your sheets to look, for example, at the septum. It's much easier and quicker done if you have a T T E probe in place. So the next thing, uh, no need for general anesthesia. I think this is uh, um, uh, something which is possible in Germany. Um, but uh, if you look at the study, um, so general anesthesia in most of the cases is, is really not needed. And it leads to a, a less um, a burden of people who are in the room. So this is not working appropriately. So I would really have to press hard and nothing is happening. So, um, but you usually, if you compare it, you need less people or less stuff in uh, the room if you, don't, if you do it um, without general anesthesia. And um, um, the safety outcome um, of the patients was similar if you use uh, general anesthesia or if you use just uh, sedation. So it's getting worse and worse. Sorry for that. So uh, no need of contrast injections. I mean, this is a little bit provocative. So I know Fabian is here in the room. He is provocative on the other hand. But do we really need contrast injections? So if we uh, look at some data, and there are even more, um, so we know that with every injection we do in the left atrial appendage, and this is why we should be a little bit cautious about it, so we can create uh, microemboli, and these can be detected uh, with the amount of injections by MRI. So um, most of these might be silent, but what is silent on the long term? Does it do any harm to the patient? So we don't actually really don't know. Okay, this is a useless tool. <laughs> Uh, so oh, are we, we we are making progress. It's getting better. Okay. So um, so we don't know actually what is the clinical impact of these MRI lesions, but we just have to be aware that we have it and that we have to be cautious about our injections. On the other hand, is it possible? And uh, Christoph, you are here in the room. You have been involved in this study. Is it possible to do a contrast-free echocardiographic guided left-handed appendage closure? And yes, it is possible. And it is possible with um, excellent results and, again, less radiation exposure. So this might be um, um, also a way to go. Um, another point which is not unimportant, especially um, um, if you really have to take an eye on the costs, um, TE is the most cost-saving imaging modality we have at the moment. And just to give you an impression what you have to spend uh, if you look at the different modalities. So a standard TE probe uh, is about uh, 17,500 in uh, Germany at least. The mini TE probe, and you usually have it in addition because you wouldn't use it for some of the procedures, for example, a mitral or tricuspid procedure because of this limited maneuverability um, uh, with this missing wheel. So this is an additional cost of 55,000 euro. There's a reason behind because um, um, the probes, uh, a lot of details on, on the probes are made manually, um, so um, uh, it's much more cost extensive. If you use an ice probe, and this is an issue, for example, in Germany, it's extra cost, it's not um, reimbursed. And I spoke to Sergio, he has a lot of experience, or Jens Eric. So an ice probe, in addition, uh, costs about uh, 3,500 to 4,000. We don't have a price for the Philips um, ice probe right now. Um, but it will be in this range or even uh, a little bit more expensive. So it is expensive, and in Germany we have to look at the cost. So this is an uh, issue in addition. The TE probe is reusable. Yeah, multiple, multiple, multiple times. So it takes a long time until um, uh, the probe is going uh, to break. And uh, this might be the same with a mini TE probe, but uh, with the eye probes, usually you have to um, exchange the ice probe. Does somebody sterilizing the ice probe? Jens, Eric? Yeah, we, uh, we uh, How? And how, how frequent can you use an ice catheter? At least five times. Five times. So this diminishes the cost a little bit, but it's additional cost. Is it reimbursed in your country? Yeah, it is reimbursed. Okay, this is good news. Not in Germany. <laughs> 
Okay, so if you look at the cost calculation, I think the clear winner is the uh, TE probe. So to summarize, standard TE is at the moment and will remain at least for the coming years, I think, the best imaging modality because it is available everywhere. So everybody has a standard TE probe for his uh, daily business um, and the daily check for the patients. It's very well standardized how we approach um, um, our procedures. So the TE probe can be maneuvered very quickly in all directions. So you can check for pericardial effusion very quickly. You can check for thrombi. And these thrombi may occur um, at any step during the procedure. So you also have to recheck again if there are some thrombi on the right atrial side, on the left atrial side of the sheath, and stuff like that. In many cases, and we do most of the cases, not in general anesthesia, so it's not necessarily, at least in Germany, and under TE guidance, contrast medium injections can usually be avoided. You might have some cases which are difficult where you need contrast injections, but usually you can avoid it if you have a sufficient uh, 3D imaging guidance during your procedure. And I think uh, it was quite clear that TE guidance is by far the most cost-effective intraprocedural imaging. And this is, at least in Germany, uh, indeed a factor to look at the costs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nia. If you want to join with us, so we will just uh, move to the next session that is going to be done by Laura Sanchez talking about miniaturized teas. Okay, uh, can I have my slides? So, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry, you were here. Uh, I'm really happy to can share also my experience, and I think that I can agree with Nina that the best option for guiding uh, left atrial appendix closure is 3D imaging with TE, but I think that the miniaturized TE it will be the future for these patients. These are my conflict of interest regarding this uh, uh, talk. And uh, as Nina uh, was showing us, uh, 3D TE is perfect for the closure. We have all the 3D capabilities, very good imaging. But uh, I will disagree with the fact of the anesthesiology because at least, at least in Spain, it's not easy to put this probe with the patient awake. Because it's not only that we do with sedation, the patient during the intervention with the mini is totally awake. And he needs to collaborate to introduce the probe. So it's something that, at least in Spain, if we want to put more anesthesio uh, anesthesia as probable, we need an anesthesiology. And also the recovery, it will be longer. Because of that, some time ago, we moved to the micro TE just to increase the turnover of the patients and to avoid to have anesthesiology. But the problem of this probe is that we only had at that moment 2D imaging. The manipulation was quite difficult. The imaging was okay, but only 2D. And the good thing is that, of course, the tolerance that the patient was awake and the quick turnover and the quick recovery of the patient. But just last year, uh, we, need, uh, we have a new probe the thing in the uh, 2D micro TE is that I think that for complex anatomy was not enough to do a safe closure. So now we have this mini TE that the tip is a little bit uh, thicker than the micro, but you can see that the tube is, is quite small, so the tolerance is super nice with, uh, for the patients. And as I will show you, we have also all the 3D capabilities that we also have with the 3D uh, TE. So I think that with this kind of probe, we have all the good things that we already have with the 3D TE and also maintaining the good part of the micro TE. So I think we have the holy grail of the uh, left atrial appendage closure. And just uh, to show you how is uh, our normal standard practice now, it used to be a screening with a 3D technique, a TE or, uh, or CT, and it was center only TE. We uh, uh, make the strategy, we select the device and the size of the device, and then we perform almost all the interventions with mini TE and no contrast, because the, you will see that the imaging is super nice. For some patients, maybe with a very difficult chicken wing, we put a little bit of contrast, and we only perform with the standard uh, TE, the interventions, if the patient needs to be intubated uh, for other reasons, as combined interventions, or maybe patients with a psychiatric disorder that don't make uh, the patient suitable for collaboration during the intervention. So this is just a, a patient that we, we performed in, in autumn. It was a patient 77 years old, hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, copt. 
he was already admitted in the hospital six months before because of bleeding, and uh, they stopped the uh, athenocumarin, but two months before the next hospital admission, they started again with rivaroxaban. So he was admitted in the hospital with this gastrointestinal bleeding, again, severe anemia, and just the digestologist asked us if we can do it uh, during the uh, hospital admission, the lefatrial apprentice occlusion, because sometimes in the eco lab we are a little bit busy, we decide to put this patient directly in the cath lab with no planification, and these are the images. You can see here that the visualization of the far field for the pericardial fusion evaluation, it's quite good with, this is, uh, with the mini probe. Uh, we can also make uh, in monoplane the, evalu monoplane the evaluation of the morphology of the uh, appendage. And uh, as you can see in the next slide, we can have this nice visualization of the ostium, the, the relation with the pulmonary risk, relation with the mitral valve. We can also uh, check the contractility as in a standard probe. We can make the measurements of the ostium and the landing zone quite nice, nicely. Uh, the imaging used to be like this in most of the patients. And then during the intervention, we have the biplane, so we can make a very safe transectal puncture. We can also check with 3D the position of the wire. In this case, you can see in the pulmonary vein. We can also check uh, the perpendicularity of the uh, catheter uh, with the appendage, as you can see in the 3D, because uh, now what we do is that we are with the catheter in the pulmonary vein, and we retire the catheter, and if it goes very perpendicular to the uh, landing zone, we just go with the device without any uh, introduction of pigtail or contrast. Uh, this patient was like that. You can see here that uh, in this case it's an unplatter. We're opening the ball, we're going in, we can position anterior posterior with the 3D. We can be sure with the uh, biplane that we have an adequate implantation in both sides. And then uh, we can check also the final result in this case, also was a very elliptic uh, landing shown, show, uh, shown, sorry, as you can see in the bottom. And you can see that with the 3D, we can also ensure that the result was good with no leaks. Uh, so our experience uh, in, in this moment with this probe, because we only have it from uh, last summer, is that we perform in the 23 weeks that we have this uh, probe 68 patients. Five patients were already scheduled with a standard probe and uh, intubation because uh, some of them have had uh, important thrombus in the screening TE and we performed with Sentinel. Uh, one patient was, uh, was a combined intervention with triclip. And uh, also we had one patient that we put it in the uh, cath lab and we tried to introduce the probe and patients start with severe nauseas, disorientation, so, so we decided to stop because we only used to put like uh, 25 or 50 milligrams of fentanyl and one milligram or two of uh, midazolam, so the patient is uh, talking all the time. So in this patient, we decided that was not a good idea, and in fact, we, we made this patient with the anesthesiologist last Wednesday, Wednesday and the anesthesiologist tried to make also a, a deep sedation without intubation, and was a disaster, as in, in the first attempt. So he ended with intubation, so it was a patient that had some problem with the sedation. So at the end, in these 23 weeks, we made 62 patients uh, with the mini uh, T and constant sedation, and the constant sedation is patient almost awake. And we have uh, no procedural complications. The first chosen device was implanted because we, in all the patients, we remeasured the landing zone at the moment of the implantation. We made almost 80% without any contrast, and the 82% of the patients uh, have a same day discharge. This is something that we can do because the re uh, recovery of the patient is super fast. We uh, used to perform four or five cases in Friday and starting uh, half past nine and finishing uh, half past two or something like that. It's one hour per patient, what we have uh, in our uh, cath lab with all the turnover and everything. Uh, the planification in our case was mostly with uh, 3D TE, but you can see here that there was an important uh, part, almost 35% uh, of the patients with no previous planification. And this is because we start doing all the same way with the 3D planification, uh, device selection and all the plan, but we start with some urgent patients that just yes, they call us if we can do it during the uh, uh, hospital admission and they were going well. So then we start to put some patients also that 
that maybe they are living far from the hospital, so it uh, was difficult for them because they are old or something like that to come to do the planification. And uh, the results, uh, as you saw in the previous slide, were quite nice. We also compare uh, of those patients that have planification with 3D echo and, uh, and remeasurement during the implantation, if there was any change in the landing zone, and you can see here that there was no any different with the plan and the thing that we measured during the intervention. So this is a, a little bit provocative, I think, but could be a new strategy just to have a clinical indication for left atrial appendage occlusion and then just get the patient to the cath lab with a mini 3D T and just make the screening at that moment. Uh, we can uh, make this maybe in most of the patients and just reserve the standard TEE for patients that needed to be intubated for other reasons. And the thing is that maybe some patients, uh, it will necessary to cancel the case because we found something in this uh, mini T performing the cath lab, but it will be only in patients with a protrusion thrombus or maybe if the left atrial appendage have extreme dimensions. But what is the problem in this patient is just to stop because at the end we only put mild sedation, the same that we put in the echo lab, and we didn't open anything at that moment. So it could be a strategy, but of course, I think it could be only performed in experienced center with several types of devices, you can, so you can adapt to the anatomy. And also, uh, it needs to be in centers with a uh, long experience, both from the interventionalist and the imager. So, as take home um, messages, for me, uh, I would say that the miniaturized TE, I think, is the future for left atrial venial occlusions. Uh, for us, was surprising the, the good tolerance and, and the imaging quality. And that with the 4D mini TE, you can do a minimalistic approach to the left atrial appendage closure, but you maintain all the 3D capabilities. So you maintain all the security because the transeptal puncture is also safer with biplane. And also to have the 3D, you can make the measurements being sure that the uh, pressure in the atrium is is high enough. You can also guide with 3D. I think that the B-plane is super useful to have a very nice deployment. And then with the 3D, you can evaluate this uh, device before release and after release, so you are sure that your closure is perfect. So I think, as I said before, that maybe, in maybe only in experience centers with multiple devices, uh, a direct left atrial appendage occlusion without previous planification could be performed. But again, experience centers, both interventionalists and imagionalist. So this is all from my side. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Laura, please take a seat. Um, I think we will have a lot of, uh, lot of food for discussions uh, with the audience. Uh, now we will just uh, move to a live case that we have recorded uh, with uh, me and Philippe uh, Garraud in Massy. Uh, and we will show you, uh, I would say, uh, a modern case of LA closure with a uh, with the CT pre-planning and, uh, and the case was performed with a new G uh, mini 3D probe. Uh, so we'll show you the case. I think there are, it's a relatively... So the, I just have to, to tell the, the summary of the, of the case. It was an 86-year-old male with a permanent AF uh, treated with a DOAC. Uh, you see a high chance vasque uh, because you need four in France to be reimbursed. Has blade of three. Uh, normally in function, uh, the patient had, had a clear contraindication to long-term DOAC because it was a recurrent GI bleeding, so it was preferred for in a massive for LA closure. Um, and probably now we'll move to the to the pre-planning, which was performed by uh, Oli the backer. Can we have the sound? LA closure. So you made a nice um, CT on this, good quality, ECG gated, a thin slice CT scan. And this is overall, you can already see it's in a, a chicken wing, classical chicken wing uh, appendage. And what do we get out of this FEOPS simulation? So first of all, what I do typically is I put this uh, yeah, contrast of the atrium a little bit in the middle. In that way, we see the full circles of the uh, ostium. And that gives us the advantage that we can then try to find what is the best implantation view here. And we, you will see it's typically always an REO. So you see here in the left bottom corner, the, the angle. So I, you almost always need an REO of, let's say, 25 minimum and maximally 50. So I try to see here, for example, an REO 35. 
And then in this particular case, it seems it's best you go caudal. So if you would have an REO 35, a caudal 10, uh, an REO 35 would be perfect. You would have, and what do I mean with perfect? It means the ostium is aligned. Uh, there's no parallax or tilt in this plane. There is a maximum separation of the LAA and the LA, the left atrium. There's no overlap because I will show you if we go, for example, cranial in this particular case, it's not any good. You see, if we would go REO cranial, in some cases this is the best, but in this particular case, you see, there would come a lot of overlap between the left atrial appendage and the left atrium. The ostium is not aligned. So this is not a useful angle to judge uh, your depth of your implantation, for example, or if you have some remaining leak, etc., etc. So I would say this particular case seems to be best with that REO 35 caudal 10. Then we go to let me see, it's in here, 3D objects. We have, of course, this is the pure anatomical ostium, and this is kind of more landing zone slash ostium watchman flex, um, either landing zone for amulet or the, the ostium for the watchman flex, I typically take in between the anatomical ostium and the landing zone for the amulet. Then if you would make a line in between there, that would be the perfect ostium measurement. Uh, place for a watchman flex. So let's see, the anatomical ostium has a maximum diameter of 36. So if we really want to go covering this appendage almost completely up to the Commodore Ridge, we will almost need a very large device that covers almost to 36. I would think a tiny bit smaller because if we look then to the watchman flex ostium, but as said, I would take it a little bit in between these two. Then this is the measurement 27.4. So I think realistically, uh, it's around probably 31 millimeter, the, the, the ostium for your Watchman Flex measurement here. And then we can go for the simulations. Then we can, it's between 31 and 35. We have some different positions. 31 proximal, this would be kind of a nice position with minimum shoulder and uh, very much coverage of the Cumberland Ridge also there, but we see a concern is that perimeter derived mean 29, we would have less than 10% compression. So I would be slightly concerned here for maybe embolization risk. So you have to go a little bit deeper. This is a little bit simulation, a little bit deeper. Uh, here we would have a compression of just a little bit above 10%, maybe 12, 13%, but you start to have incomplete coverage uh, up to the ostium. So let's see if 35 could do any better. The 35 uh, proximal, this is 35. We would have a compression of around 15, 16%. That would be definitely possible. We would have full coverage to the ostium. We would all, on the other hand, also have a little bit of shoulder. Maybe it starts to become almost a little bit too much shoulder, I would say. Let's see if they have a simulation a little bit deeper. They do have. Then we have a little bit less shoulder. We have almost still complete coverage up to the ostium. And uh, we have also a compression of almost 20%, I would say, 18%. So this seems good. But on the other hand, uh, less coverage up to the ostium. And then a distal, uh, as said again, you they cannot simulate very distal because it goes very tapered. It would only start to tilt more. You would still have that same compression of around 17, 18%, and you would have less complete coverage to the ostium. So I would go probably, based on these simulations, for a 35 device, either in this proximal position or in this a tiny little, little more distal uh, position. So that would be the recommendation based on these simulations. Then if we go, finally, I forgot to do this in the beginning, for the transeptal puncture, because of the angulation and the orientation of the appendage, you can already clearly see that coming from posterior here in the fossa would give you the best alignment for your delivery sheet. So a posterior puncture, 100% sure. And then I will show you that an inferior puncture is also the best and that's actually always the best. You see, if you come from inferior, you have by far the best al alignment with the, the LAA central axis. You will never have this if you do a, a superior puncture. So in conclusion, infro-posterior uh, transeptal puncture and then an closure. If you want to go for perfection with coverage up to the ostium, and we know that this gives less risk of uh, device-related thrombus, I think we should go for a uh, 35 millimeter Watchman Flex 
in some kind of proximal position, whether you go for this uh, or the slightly slightly deeper, that's up to what you can achieve during uh, the case, I would say, Philippe. Thank you very much, Ole. So now let's go to the CAT lab and try to do what you suggest. We are going to highlight the imaging possibilities uh, of uh, all the systems we have, uh, meaning that we will show the mini T probe TE that you have now on the screen. Uh, it's, uh, as you know, a mini a 3D uh, TE with a micro probe, mini probe. And our patient today is conscious, he has just local anesthesia. And also you see on the screen there are some uh, drawings and features of the, of the device. So this is the fusion of CT with, with the fusion uh, of uh, fluoroscopy that we have today. So, so very important to tailor your transeptal puncture. So just ask the sonographer, uh, I'm still superior here, I think. Huh? Yes, the resistant thing is posterior, uh, posterior and, and mid. Uh, mid, you mean mid, uh, in mid inferior? Mid, yeah, it, uh, mid inferior and uh, okay. posterior. I try to come down. So we try to go inferior and mid. Yes, yes. Can you show me maybe just a bicable, just a, a single bicable that I can see really the superior and inferior? Yes. Uh, oh, it's a very inferior actually. Yeah, you, you're no, inferior. It, it's super you're inferior. inferior. Oh. Okay, now I moved a little bit more yeah, like uh, in the middle. Mid, uh, okay. Mid, uh, so this is not bad actually, no? Yeah, yes. I think we are. Uh, this is not bad. The patient uh, is... Yeah, but I crossed the septum. So yes, this yeah, is... you are on the left. Uh, what do you think? It's not bad, no? Yes, it's a pretty good function. Okay, I, I will probably go there. I meet. It's okay. I mean, uh, I think it's good. we can work with that. Okay. We will do our first injection here. Yeah. So we see that I can bring the, the, the catheter relatively in a good coaxial alignment with the neck of the appendage, which is already a good sign. Let's see if we can hold that during the case. So we are going to do our angio injection and we'll keep this view during the case. Okay. So here we are. So as you can see, we are going to register, meaning that we put the drawing of the appendage on the appendage that we have live today on the fluoro. Okay, so we we are in place now with the with the sheet inside, not too deep, of course, huh, because we don't need to go deep. So uh, the sheet is uh, at the level of the neck, approximately. So now what we do with Philip that I remove the pigtail. Yes. The okay. sheet is in place with a good uh, good orientation already. I have a good I have a and good uh, back bleed, and then connect. you can inject water, and I connect wet to wet. Yeah. Liquid to liquid. Liquid to liquid, and I advance now the delivery sheet. Ah, okay, now it jumped out from the appendage, no problem, because now I know that I can come back really easily like this, just by doing a counterclockwise rotation. So, of course, the first thing is to adjust the tip, it's okay. So, I go marker to marker here, distal marker, okay. I do this click back. I open now the flex ball, which, as you know, has a um, closed distal end, which is totally atraumatic, and we need to have a width, two times the width of the delivery of the access sheet, sorry. So the next step is that, uh, first of all, uh, it's nice that I have the, the fluoro here, that the fusion, and I check now with the echo the depth, and I try to go a little bit deeper than, than what I have here, because I think it's yes. not, probably not deep enough. I think, I think you see here we have some some, some, some bending, bend already, some bending. So I meaning probably, that we are probably at the maximum working yeah, depth we can have. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so there are two solutions: either I go deeper or I try here. I think I will try here. So maybe I will leave um, Philippe. Yeah. What, what do you do, Philippe? You you push I, or I you? I will. No, no. I will pull back. You pull back. You can okay. pull back, and I, I keep the, the the device. Okay. Fixed. So you you do the you do everything. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah. Let's, do, let's do it. Okay. Do it slowly. Just keep the, the I keep, angle. I keep, I keep the catheter here. Okay. Oh, I disconnected. Disconnected here. Okay. Go. Cool. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 
You see, we're going to... It, it does the deployment very slowly and we don't have any bend here. Yeah, I so think it's good to go slowly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because you keep the orientation. You know, it takes as, time as to... To expand. To open and expand and be... That's very nice, Philippe. And now, Philippe, what you will do, of course, is to put a, some forward pressure to, yes, to avoid the device to conform to the... It's very nice, actually, because we are really in line with the neck of the appendage. Yep. And it was very nice to have the fusion also to, to, to allow this extremely slow deployment. So this I like very much because uh, despite the fact that we have put a 35, we have really placed the device in line with the neck of the appendage. We, we yep. didn't go into the bend. Huh? And so no, no. now... We have, I think we have almost the reach almost covered, despite the fact that we have a watchman, which is always difficult yeah. to cover the reach completely. So a very nice deployment, slow. And, um, and the level is quite okay. You can yeah. see that the first measurement is 25, which is, which is really nice. Is we have a 30% great. Great. Uh, compression. And you uh, see with ECO, we can really nicely see that we don't have too much protrusion, we have a nicely deployed... Almost nothing. Deployed, almost, yeah, almost nothing. Yeah, almost nothing. A little bit on the mitral, as always. Yeah, yeah. But, but here we're 26, 27. 27 uh, at this time. So I mean, we must be honest, compression. it's not always easy to achieve uh, that kind of position with a watchman. I mean, no, because no, every no. time you have a bend, you have to go relatively deep inside, and you, you end Absolutely. up with a shoulder or some part of the reach not covered. Not bad, huh? Really good. Not bad, actually. So maybe it moved a little bit proximal. We have a little bit more of shoulder, but uh, we're still quite uh, deep inside. Yes. And, and uh, probably I will not... I'm not sure, Adele, that we can go more distant. No, because no, as you can see, no. maybe the tip of the device could be a little bit in yeah, the bend. I agree. But we have the, shul the distal shoulder, which is well opposed. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We are really at the roof of the, of the neck of yeah. the appendage, and so we cannot go more distal than this. And a, a large part of the device is really inside the appendage, so I'm not yeah. afraid about any kind of embolization. What we can do, of course, is a, it's a tuck test to see the, the stability of the device. So you know that uh, the flex is really more stable than the other one, so I do. I, I just show you the, the tug, which is extremely stable. It's not moving at all. Nice. Yeah, nice. Okay, so the tug test is done. Um, I think the NGO is also very reassuring. Uh, and probably that will be the final position, I think. Yeah, yeah. We have all the criteria for yeah. stability. Exactly. We have the tug, we have compression. A nice it's compression, good, yeah. yes. a nice shape. It's a, like a bell shape, actually. So mean, meaning yeah. that we have a, around 10 to 15% of compression, which is always, I think, the good rate uh, of compression. And we keep some proximal implant, which is really important, as you know. Exactly. Because we want to avoid uh, the incidence of device-related thrombosis, which exactly. is probably best prevented by proximal position, as Xavi shown. Sure, sure. Do you have leaks, uh, Victor? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think it's well uh, opposed. In, in today, in today, there is no, no leak. No pre device uh, leak. Um, That's very nice. Huh? No conflict with the mitral valve. No Excellent. significant okay. conflict. So we release. Yeah. So it's a good result. I let Philippe do. Yeah, go. Uh, and the fusion was very helpful here. Yeah, you see the device is super stable and released. Just do a last shot. Perfect. Great. So, Adele, uh, summary of the case. Summary what of the would case. You, I, I would say... You... I, okay, so first of all, we need to take into consideration two major aspects of each LAO closure is the pre-planning with the adequate sizing then a good transeptal puncture, if you respect these two steps, the procedure will go very straightforward, very easy. Uh, here it was a relatively straightforward appendage, but, but we can say that because we have done a good planning before and we knew what we were doing. So I think this is a very nice uh, implantation because I know that probably on the follow-up you will not have any kind of leak. You, the reach is almost covered, so the risk of DRT is extremely small. Of course, you have other 
patient-related factors that can also create DRT, but at least in terms of uh, procedure, we have done our best to, to, to decrease this risk to minimal. Uh, the setting, as you can see, it's uh, still um, a patient. It's not on general anesthesia, so for the workflow of the cat lab, it's even easier. And we have tested today the the the, the 3D uh, Mini T Pro from GE. So this is a very modern setup with uh, CT fusion, Mini T with 3D uh, capabilities, pre-planning, and you see first first attempt and perfect closure. So thank you, Philippe. Okay, great case, and, and you know, with full imaging, so you had everything. And so let's move to the last talk with David Arzamendi. He's going to talk about the, the only method that we didn't show, that it's the, the eyes, and then we can have the discussion. Hi, good morning. You showed you are really talented because despite that the fusion wasn't good, you were able to find what was appendage. So. <laughs> I think this, this shows this is a perfect case to show that this is something that we need to improve. And probably it's a good tool, but it's something that we need to improve. So my talk is about the intracardiac echo use in the, in the appendage closure procedure. And I don't know if it's the future, but what's clear is that for some of us, it's a reality because we don't have the availability of the imaging specialist or the anesthesiologist any time of the week, any hour of the week. And this allows us to work and do cases uh, uh, and schedule that them all by ourselves. Uh, the, the thing is that probably the, the feeling is that all the structural interventions are going more and more minimalist, and we're trying to decrease the access, decrease the anesthesia, decrease the echo size, everything, so to make the procedure uh, more simple, but at the same time, we have to keep the safety thing. So that's an important uh, message that we have to send also. So probably to get into the ICE program, it's important to get some experience doing all sorts of procedures and probably st st starting with the more simple ones. The reason we are going more minimalist, probably it's being came from the necessity. In one side, the, all the structural heart intervention uh, numbers are increasing. In all the labs, we are almost doing uh, the same structural cases that coronary cases, and this is growing and growing. In the other hand, uh, the COVID push us hard uh, to be able to do cases and being able to discharge patients the same day. Another reality all around Europe is that we are a lack of anesthesia, and probably all that together um, push us to find different ways to go for the appendage closure. It's true that it's, uh, ice, uh, it's not only uh, used for appendage closure, we can use it in other sorts of procedures, but what we suggest is probably the easiest way to start is going for PFO closure because you can practice there, you can take all sorts of images, you can get, get guide it properly, and it's difficult you, that you get into trouble uh, with appendage closure, with a PFO closure, so I think it's a good way to start. The numbers are pretty high, so I think you can get a good, a good practice with that. But you can use also in other procedures. This is a combined case with appendage and, 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 and taber. So in this case, we already had the transeptal done. So we used the eyes to do the LVOT imaging. So you can see in this case, this is a self-expandable valve. And it's pretty useful to see if you are deep enough and if we are in the right spot. I'm sure that nowadays, most of us, we are doing this fluoro-guided. But it's an extra information that you get in some cases that if you have doubts, if you are not too high, etc. At the same time, it's good because you can check at the end for the leakage, as you can do it with TOE. But in this case, the patient is awake, and you are doing all perfectly and having a good uh, assessment of the leakage. Moreover, it's not only useful for TABER, it's been useful in our case for uh, H2H repair intracuspid side. Uh, as you know, there are several cases with patients with uh, mitral mechanical valves, and the shadowing of that is sometimes difficult to assess the perfect grasping of the leaflets. And on those cases, we put the probe in, and as you can see, you can see perfectly that the two leaflets are inside, and you can be sure that you, have, you are having a good uh, tissue there, and you can release the device safely. We have without having any surprise. But we have talk, come here to talk to about appendage closure. So the thing is that sometimes uh, the question with eyes is if it's safe, if, uh, if we do have the same success rate that we have with TOE, if it's more time consuming, what about the leaks, if it's cost effective, is, what about the comfort of the patients? 
So the first message that we have, that it came, that it, it makes something, I, I think some people to stop a little bit with their eyes is that it turns out that uh, something that it, mean, it, mean, it seems really reasonable is that the leaks are a problem and the, that, the, that they, they have um, more events that if you have a perfect signal of the appendage, so you have to be sure that you are able to assess perfectly with, a, with any sort of imaging that you are not leaving any, any significant leaks on the patients because the, otherwise you won't have a, a good result. But at the same time, we were lucky to participate in this study led by Eric, and, and the truth is that when you do ice-guided TOE, uh, ice-guided LA closure, and, and using most of the cases uh, city-guided sizing, you can have exactly the same results that you are if you are using TOE. So the, the, the leakage uh, percentage wasn't greater than with TOE cases, and the truth is that uh, the, the adverse uh, events, they were really, really low. It should that probably most of the centers, they had a huge experience, but the results were really reassuring for those that we are working with ICE for appendage closure. The good thing is that maybe we are talking about the future, but, but I think the message today uh, that I want to send is that uh, eyes guided uh, appendage closure now it's standardized. So I think most of the barrier that we have, we have clear that CT is a good tool to have a really good size of the appendage. So you are not, you, when, once you get into the procedure, you already have, you know which is going to be the size of the device that you're going to use. You can do a perfect sizing before, and even if you want to go more over, you can use other sort of uh, tools that you can assess, even the transept path puncture, which is going to be a central line. We have been talking about FIOPS and other systems. This is a BIDA. This is a system that we are using, and it was perfectly. So you can have a perfect idea of the anatomy, and which is going to be the challenge of the procedure that you are doing. So once you get that, you can go for the, for the ice-guided procedure. And uh, you can guide every step of the procedure for the transeptal, you can check perfectly that you are inferior. Sometimes uh, to avoid uh, moving the proof, what we do is we use, we use the fluoro to check if we are posterior. So you can get even when you're going through the septum, you can check for thrombus as, as well as you are doing as with a TOE. I think the imaging quality is good enough. We have, as I say, the standard abuse now. In the past, we're putting the probe in and we're going up and down and we didn't know exactly where to check. We know that we, you now you can go mid appendage, you can go to the pulmonary vein, you can go down to the, to the mitral view and you know exactly what we are you, uh, viewing and you can do all the measurements and you can check if the device is, is in the right spot. So as I said, in this case, we are using the two different views that we use most of the cases. We are using the mitral view, that it's an equivalent of the 135 of the TOE. And in the other side, you can see a cranial view in mid-appendage, that this is a, an equivalent of the 45 TOE imaging. And, and the quality of the image is pretty good, and we can see that the device is in the right spot. And moreover, as I said, you can guide even other steps. You can check that you are cannulating uh, the appendage perfectly with a pigtail. So we can do it also without contrast. If you are interested on that, this was a patient with a, a kidney failure, so we did all uh, just echo-guided. And you can check also the depth of the deployment. You can see here we are doing a slow deployment of the lava. You can see perfectly how we are getting almost close to the landing zone. Maybe we are a bit deep, but you can see it perfectly without touching the probe. You just leave it there, and you can do it all by yourself. You can do the tack test. So comparing to other other uh, other. Uh, the sort of imaging assessment, the, the main advantage of the ACE probably is that you can do it uh, all alone. You can be a single operator for that. And nowadays, the process that we are using, they're pretty stable. So once you have a perfect position, you don't, you don't need to move it. You can have continuous monitoring of the heart. It's a fast change of the patients. The learning curve probably is one of the limitations. But as I said, you can start with other sorts of procedures to increase uh, your experience. But uh, this is just to show the differences with the micro uh, TOE with the, and the image quality of the, of the eyes. And, this, and I think the, the quality of the eyes is pretty good. But the future, if we want to talk the future, probably the future is the 4D uh, eyes. So this is a case that we did last week. And the good thing is that this is something that we asked to the company. As you can see, my prof here is on the right side. So I can check the appendage from the right side. So I can start the procedure checking if there is any clot on the appendage without doing the transeptal. 
This is something that makes it probably a bit even safer, but the good thing is that it is true that the size of the sheath is a bit higher, but the quality and the depth is also better. So we are able from the right side to check if there is any clotting on the appendix. So after that, once when we discard that, you can continue with the procedure. The second positive thing is something that also Laura commented that uh, you can assess the transeptal using the multiplan view and you can do some sort of an explain and you can check just in one position. You can see, see the super posterior and anterior posterior views so you can see that you are doing the, poncer, the puncture in the right spot. And moreover, uh, you can uh, even in, in a case that maybe you don't have a pre-assessment, you can do the, the 3D imaging of the appendage and you can get all the me measurements directly and the quality, as you can see, I think is as good as you, you were doing that with TOE. And, and it's, it, the truth is that we thought that it was going to be a trouble going through the septum with the sheet because a bit, it's a bit larger, but it's a bit more rigid too. So it, the truth is that it, it was pretty easy to go through the septum to get good quality images of the appendage. So I think this is probably the way we'll be working in the future. So probably the summary is that eyes look something fancy and something that it was uh, to get like pre-images and things like that into the heart. But now I think I think it's something really practical that from some operators can be really can really work. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, great talk. So uh, we have a lot of time for for discussion. Can can I have the slides? So uh, unfortunately, Martin Swans could not uh, join us uh, because he had uh, another commitment. He had to go to uh, Madrid, still in Spain, but uh, not here. But uh, yeah, yeah, he apologized. So um, uh, I will maybe start to show his slides, and I've added some slides from from myself. Um, so let's let's move his slides and let's start the discussion. Maybe we can uh, we can uh, uh, turn on the light, please. Uh, no, I just have to move this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, sorry. Um, so that was his slide. So intrapersonal imaging is an integral part of uh, the procedure. It's essential for guidance, for sure, uh, especially for complex LA morphologies. Uh, what are the requirements for imaging? Uh, so this is something that we can discuss together. Of course, you want to have the best possible image quality. And uh, we know uh, Nina has shown that uh, the, the best you can get for sure is for, uh, for a classical 2D uh, TE probe, but uh, the other imaging modalities are also coming up with uh, improvements and probably it's going to uh, improve over time. So uh, things are, are changing. Um, so we want an adequate and detailed evaluation of the morphology, the most accurate measurements that we can still discuss how we measure, do we measure uh, intra-procedural or do we measure before or, uh, uh, of course, if I have Nina in the lab, I'm fully confident that my measurement will be very good, but not everybody has Nina in the lab. And so sometimes uh, you, you need to, uh, to have uh, some backup for, for your sizing. Um, so I see the possibility to change the image view quickly and without limitation, uh, have wide angles, small sections, etc. So I will maybe, uh, so maybe I will just skip all these things. Um, and I will go maybe to, sorry, uh, just to this slide that shows actually the, yeah, here. I think this really nicely summarized, this was the, uh, the picture from an edit editorial in Jack regarding the, the, the advantages. And let's start with this, okay? Uh, let's start with standard T. So everybody is using, uh, a lot of centers in the world are using uh, standard T. We have seen the US, uh, the penetration of ice is only 6%. Uh, Mini T, I think uh, very few centers are using it. Uh, maybe it can be promoted. Uh, so the strengths of, of standard T, so the excellent image quality. The expertise available, because most of the time you have a very experienced sonographer. But I think the need for general anesthesia, that's, that for me it's a drawback. If you want to increase your, uh, your uh, workflow, your number of cases, if you want to make your cat the life in your cat lab easier, uh, probably you need to move to a more streamlined procedure and avoid the general anesthesia. Um, the need for a dedicated cardiac imager, but the same for mini, for mini micro, the patient discomfort due to the general anesthesia and the esophageal injury due to the fact that you implant a relatively large probe in the esophagus and it has been shown that it's associated with some injury. So let's start first with this. Uh, if in the audience you have any kind of comments, okay. Chavi, please. At the end, it's a matter of reimbursement and it's the reality that yesterday we saw with Philippe that there are like three models no? in, in Europe. 
is the mother in Central Europe of a standard tea. I think that, Nina, we can discuss about, you know, if bringing the patient directly to the lab um, without, you know, pre-planning. Of course, you know, doing the 3D pre-planning, you know, in the, in the table, this is something that sounds reasonable, but then there's all the, the other model that it's like always CT and then um, TE and, and ice and like a mix of, you know, miniaturized ice and th th for, for the rest, no southern and the, the western part of Europe. So. Yeah, Xavi, I'm interested. I mean, we, we talked about uh, different minimalistic approaches. Yeah, so Jens Eric, for you, a minimalist approach is to do a great pre planning, have the patient in the cath lab, do eyes imaging, very short procedure, correct? Yeah, that's my approach. Okay, Fabian, Fabian, where's Fabian? Fabian, if uh, you would have to define what is a minimalistic approach, what would be your approach? And I'm interested, what are you using as a pre planning tool? Um, some kind of imaging, maybe a CT, for example, a patient that is undergoing TAVI at the same time. He has a TAVI pre-planning CT, so there I use the CT. In other patients, I would use a TEE to exclude for thrombus and to see whether there is a PFO. Um, but I think, and I'm, I'm actually... Uh, still surprised that I'm the only one doing the procedure only with with uh, with fluoro. So that's my min minimalistic approach, and I don't need. Uh, I only need local anesthesia, um, not even conscious sedation. You can talk with the patient, and obviously there are disadvantages. I I I don't neglect that, and I think there are advantages to have a TEE, miniaturized TEE or ice during the procedure, but there are also disadvantages. It takes longer, costs. No, I'm coming from a poor country, so we have to look <laughs> for costs. But um, also, the procedure takes longer. You spend more time in the left atrium. Um, so these are the disadvantages. The disadvantage of only using a fluoroscopy, obviously, is you, you, you just have one modality. Uh, that guides you, and, and I would not say that this is something for a beginner. This is something for, for experts like we, we are here. You have to have done a lot of procedures. You need to feel comfortable. But what I see a lot uh, when proctoring is that actually the, the imaging is very, very often used for transeptal puncture, what we discussed uh, uh, before. And the actual procedure, many people rely on, on, on angiography. And I'm missing a bit the aspect of angiography. We're discussing different imaging modalities, but nobody is talking about the, the value of angiography. So, excellent. So this is an extreme position. Uh, just to get the third idea, which is also a minimalistic approach, Laura, what you suggested, so we don't even do a pre-planning. We have everything in the cupboard, what we can use as devices, and we just use a micro-TE during the procedure for measuring, for doing everything. So we have very, very, very different positions here in this expert panel coming from very extreme sides. So my question to you would be, are we ready for a minimalistic approach? Are we ready to recommend something like that for the general practitioners outside? Uh, so, uh, um, doing a pre-procedural uh, TOE before, a couple of weeks before the procedure, it helps you to identify patients who have bad imaging quality. Sometimes it, it's, it happens that you have not suboptimal TOE images and then you're not surprised during the procedure. So uh, I think it helps to have it beforehand instead of just only on the table. And second, you mentioned esophageal injury for TOE, but if you would do ice uh, in many more countries and centers with a blunt tip, I think we would see, maybe we would see more complications with the blunt tipped ice than we would have esophageal injury cases, no? Can I? Can I comment? Uh, I think that we have to, uh, if we think about a consensus, we, I, think, I think this slide is not correct because uh, we have to talk with the different uh, center. So uh, this slide is perfect if you have uh, already done 200 uh, procedures, so you can move from one to another. But uh, what we say to the, uh, to the center that do very few procedures, so I think that uh, the standard TE is perfect for Learning for a center that are starting and for a center that you don't feel uh, so 
uh, safe. I mean, uh, they do very few procedures. Because we are talking about a center in uh, Europe, they're doing like 200 procedures every year, and then in Italy is not like this. There are big centers, there are small centers. So I think this have to be adapted to, to the number of the cases that you... But I think you, you can't tell uh, operators what to do. You have to offer, if you decide to go TOE, how you need to do it. Exactly. If you decide to go with micro, how to, you can do it, uh, and if you go with ice, how you will do it. Exactly. What I, what I would like to have here is the, is the from Nina, from, from here, the, what is the, the minimal requirement for each procedure modality? Okay. When to start, when to go from more mini-invasive? I fully agree that... You, you need a certain level of experience to move to a more mini-invasive strategy. I have strongly uh, disencouraged people to start with ice or, or, or things like that. You need to start with a correct setting and comfortable and things like that. I mean, uh, I fully agree with that. So maybe, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to agree to some point. So we have to, to make a consensus of minimal um, requisites that are required and as a default strategy. And a default strategy would be some kind of uh, uh, 3D pre-procedural uh, pre planning and inter-procedural imaging. And what kind of imaging, pre and post or inter-procedural, then we can discuss depending on local, uh, local resources and um, um, expertise. But I think this should be the default strategy and not having pre-procedural planning can be a bailout situation if, if it's not possible, but in a perfect setting, you want to have this information to know I don't want to have uh, stress uh, for uh, during a LA closure because I don't I, it's, I see that it's a I very complex you're raising a, you're raising a super important point and I would like to have the the, the advice from the audience is that um, okay we've seen that Laura you have also shifted to uh, take the measurement and let's let's say it like that discover the case because now you have 3d capabilities during the case mm -hmm. because the patient cannot come whatever okay that's probably is a reason why you are doing that. But how do you feel here that even if you do 2DT, uh, 2D, I mean 2D probe, sorry, no, with 3D capabilities, uh, importance of pre-planning or do we go, uh, do we advise to go in the case and do the measurement during the case or having something before? Personally, I like to have everything before and have the, the T for guidance, take another set of measurement if needed, but I like to have my case prepared up front. So I would like to have, who, for example, here, who in the audience like pre-planning? Please let me, raise your hand. I also like it. <laughs> okay. So, the, so we have a majority of people that will want to have some imaging before. It can be whatever we want, but they want to have some imaging before. Whatever is the modality used during the procedure. Is it, is it right? Yeah? Okay. Yes, there, yeah, there's like consensus. Like That's fantastic. Yeah, I, and Fabian, you raised your hand. I've realized that. Great. So there's consensus. We need something in advance. Can, can I just... I don't know what the colleagues said here is pre-planning. It's also Mm. So it's just pre-planning done right in the cap, and mm. it's just a no. logistic little uh, difference. No, and, and, and it's true, and it's provocative, but, it, but yeah. then you can have the, the LA pressure, you can have like functional information. Yeah. As long as you have, you know, like the, the device on the shelf, it's pre-planning, but no. five minutes before. I mean, that's not the same because but, but if, if you as take I said, I think it, it's only for, for centers with a lot of experience. I think it's something that, that you cannot invite the people to do like this. Mm. And if they are starting, I think it, it's a good plan to have a 3D planning, uh, CT or TOE, and make the first uh, cases with patient intubated, a standard 3D probe. And so you have all the time, you can talk, you have the proctor, because if not with the patient awake, they are saying, oh, I don't know what to do, or we have a problem. I think it's horrible for the patient. And, so we and, also need to think in the operator and, and Laura, the it's also important to point out that the, the, the echo is done before any aggression yeah. to the patient. Yeah. So it's like if you're doing the, the TOE, like in the standard um, echo lab. But, you know, but instead of uh, there, you're there, but, but you know, in, I, I'm going to, I mean, I, I, I do agree with this setting, but if you go to the price thing, this is more expensive. What I mean is that if, in the, if she cancels a case where, where you are doing this, the screen in the cat lab, this is more expensive than if you cancel the case if she's doing that in the eco lab. Yeah, it depends on the country. Well, it's, it's, no, I mean, if you go for the money... I, I also not, not no, okay. If you calculate uh, the cost of pre-procedural pre planning with CT or T the other day, and then the cost of the cases which no, you no, conceal on the table, it's... 
No, no, I'm not saying globally. I'm saying that if you cancel, this really penalizes. I mean, it's something that if you want to do all the cost effectiveness study, doing a TOE in a CAT lab is more expensive than doing a TOE in the Ecolab. Yeah, if you consider that it, the TOE must be in general anesthesia, but in, in Germany, in Poland, we are not doing TOE on the table in general anesthesia almost in any case. It's a, in a local anesthesia or, let's say, uh, do slight pay, sedation. Do they pay the same for the angioplasty than for an echo? Once again? Do they pay the same for, a cor for angioplasty than for an echo? I don't think so. If you miss an angioplasty, you are earning less money that yeah. if you miss an echo, that's, the, that's, that's what I mean. I don't disagree with the, with the strategy. What I mean is that if the, at the end you do a study and you go, do you want to touch also the money thing, this penalizes this sort of decision. I, I have a I, I, can I make a comment? I have a question to Laura. Uh, Laura, do, do you trust in the same way, do you trust in the same way your 3D imaging with the mini TE as with a regular yeah. TE Pro, because, it's, the, for, yeah, because the, the quality of the images is not the same, you trust it in the, the same way. Yes, if you go to the very far field, for example, for tricuspid, it's not good enough, but appendix, yes. And regarding the, the cancellation, I think that maybe it will be 1% uh, of the patient or less, so it's worth it because we are putting five patients in a day, so if one patient every, I don't know how many weeks, goes cancel, I think it's not a big deal. Hmm. And also for the patients, they are super happy because they just came in the morning, they go to the collab and they are discharged in the afternoon. And if not, it's like coming to the collab. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Adele. For the purpose of the consensus, I think we have to acknowledge there are different ways of doing the procedure and guiding the procedure, which is what we learn from this room. And this is really good and exciting to have this, this discussion. Uh, and also there are good combinations of pre-planning and then procedure guidance imaging. And I think it's really important to say that we have to use the one where we trust, we feel safe for the procedure, for the patient, and we feel we can achieve the best procedure results. And the second point is, of course, miniaturized, minimalistic is the best if we can achieve, but what is minimalistic? It is, from our point of view, it, it's a teamwork. If I have an anesthetist, it's not a problem for me to have a general anesthesia. No, no, sure. Uh, but on the other hand, if I don't have an anesthetist and I am not in Germany and Poland, it's absolutely impossible, impossible to have a TOE uh, like that. So, I mean, we have to face that just to be, to acknowledge there are different ways and we have to use the best one but we have to uh, validate our strategy. I mean, if you know you are doing that and you have good results, you have few leaks, few DRT, that's okay. Sure, sure. Can, uh, can, can I just... Can I make one comment? I think we're discussing a lot next to each other and I do it like this, I do it like that. I think everybody has his own method and that works best for himself and we need to figure out based on clear endpoints, well-defined endpoints, which strategy gives uh, good safety endpoints, good efficacy endpoints, and, and based on those endpoints, and maybe this is a good uh, place to discuss, to discuss which endpoints should we compare to each other. And there's numerous ways probably to achieve good endpoints. That's a great discussion, but we have to like define what do we want to reach and, and, and objectivated. What I meant before is that, unfortunately, the different health systems push us to do it in a different way. So this is something that we need to accept. So I think you have to offer different ways and see, say what's a standard way to do that. So how you standardize the echo guiding, how you standardize or try to standardize the, even because echo, TO guided, there, there is already a discre discrepancy. You are doing it with sedation. Most of the centers are doing it with general anesthesia. So probably these are the points that we have to touch, but not saying that this is better than the other because there are already studies done that have shown that one is as effective as the other. Yeah, but, but, uh, but I, I, I understand what Lisbeth said, that now we are defining the, the different, uh, I would say, setup and what is the best practice in each for each modality. But it's true that in the future, uh, and that's the goal also of this club, that we can 
set up some randomized trial comparing, for example, Minity to a standard and have a classical endpoint, like, for example, recovery and the time in the cat lab or a, a discharge, same day discharge and things. And then we will have a clear endpoint. But at, at the time being, what we can see from what has been published before, it's that most of these uh, techniques are, red, are safe in the hands of experienced operators uh, knowing how to use these techniques. So maybe we, we also have a lot of ICE operators here. I, mean, I, I, I want to know their, their feeling about that. Uh, Sergio and Jens Eric, you are super experienced, uh, and David also, of course. Uh, tell us a bit. I think that the, the point is uh, we have to divide the cost and the, 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 the planning. Uh, my opinion is that the preprocedural planning is essential because uh, when uh, we enter in CATLAB, we should have clear in, in our mind what we have to do, the procedural planning, the single step, so the procedure is easier. And, but it, it, the, you can use uh, the imaging modality that you are more, uh, in, in which you are more confident. Can I interrupt you two seconds? For ICE, do you yeah. recommend to have 3D pre-planning, or yes or no? Yes. Okay, in all cases. And, and yes, do, you, do, you start ICE, a case, yes. do you start a case if you don't have, uh, do, you start, do you do an ICE case if you don't have uh, 3D pre-planning before? Uh, exactly. Yeah? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I would, would stress, uh, a concept about the thrombus inside, because if you perform a CT scan or whatever you want, more than one week before, you can find the thrombus in the cat lab, and this is very disappointing. Yeah, sure. So we usually perform a TOE one day or two days before in order to avoid this, this issue. And I think we have to stress and that this procedure, the uh, TOE, can be done without an anesthesiologist. This is our practice, it's possible. Then I think it's a very important point to, focus, to be focused on. But I think to summarize that, I mean, we heard a lot. So we have different aspects. So we have to look uh, to validate the outcomes that what Lisbeth's part, and I think it's important. But at the moment, we have very different approaches, and everybody succeeds with his approach. And uh, we also have some agreement that maybe what we are doing or you are doing as experts might not be advisable for somebody who is a beginner. So we have different points and aspects to take into consideration. So Ola, you wanted to no, uh, want, comment? Yeah, it's interesting to hear the discussion, but I think if you think of a consensus statement, then I think the only thing we have to recommend as a level one is that at some point, some 3D imaging should be done. And really, whether it is pre-procedural, mm. intra-procedural, TE, mini TE, whatever it is, I don't care. Everybody should do what they want. I mean, and that should be the recommendation, you know? I mean, it should be that at some point, some 3D imaging should be done. That should be the high recommendation. And I think if you go then for 2D eyes during a procedure, yeah, then you don't have the possibility to do, to do 3D imaging um, during the procedure, then you need your 3D imaging beforehand. But if I get a good 3D eyes, maybe in a couple of years, I mean, or next year, because you show there the Siemens, I've been using it too, it's, to be honest, the, it's inferior quality, the imaging uh, of the echo, so it's not really usable, I think, so for now. But you see, I mean, it's, you have to recommend level one, 3D imaging has to be done wherever it is, because it's, I mean, for example, in the US, many people have referrals from 100, 150 kilometers far away. You cannot do pre-procedural planning. You cannot recommend to, so everybody has to see in, in the situation he works in, the logistical reimbursement limitations, anesthesia, easy to get, yes or not, yes or no. I mean, that's, so for me, that's the take home message that at one particular moment, for example, doing just the 2D TEE with the classical 0, 45, 19, 0, 135 measurements, which many centers still do, mm -hmm. that should be kind of strongly, strongly discouraged. Mm -hmm. That's not contemporary practice anymore. But, but based on what evidence would you suggest that? If somebody... Because you know that you just if you do a 3D multiplane reconstruction, you have much more accurate uh, measurements. But from an from a outcome perspective, one would suggest that Show me data showing Yeah, I, I think there is data already. I mean, there's data showing that you have to use less uh, device changes if you do 2D or 3D echo, or that that's there. And also, in a way, we, we 
think Fabian is a kind of an extremist here, but on the other hand, <laughs> um, I think fluoro is indeed, we don't discuss this enough. I mean, if I do, for example, my, for me then, I, my 3D moment is pre-procedural, that's my heavyweight of 3D, and then during the procedure I try to simplify as much as possible too. And in a way, my eyes, I use it almost to do just safely my procedure to make sure I don't make any mess or any complications, but my fluoro is my main guidance to do my procedure for 80, 70, 80%, and then my eyes guides me to, to see, okay, I'm in the right spot, I don't make a complication here, I do everything safe. So I think he also has a point that we, if we discuss and typically imaging, the fluoro, where, which everybody uses, we almost never, we don't even spend five minutes discussing this. So that, that's also a point, I think, which is true. I mean. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yesterday, Philip showed us uh, that still the most preferred uh, approach is uh, T-guided LAAC in general anesthesia. And uh, I think the, the reason that this can work is that it's still a relatively low volume uh, of procedures we are doing, but we have to face the future. In two years' time, we have to do uh, the double number of LAAC procedures, three years' time, maybe triple. And we expect this uh, type of procedure to uh, increase very fast in the future. So I think we need to focus on simplification. And I totally agree that there are multiple ways you can do ice. Ice should be done also with good training. It should be very safe and it's perfect if you come uh, from a background where you also use it for PFO, etc. But I can tell one example. I have been proctoring in uh, South America, in Chile. In Chile, they didn't have a program for uh, LAAC simply because they couldn't get anesthesiology service in Chile. So they wanted me to come there and learn them uh, to do ice-guided uh, procedures. And they started out from baseline using ice, and they are doing a high number of procedures now in Chile only with ice-guarded approach. They never learned anything else. So it can be done, and it can be done safely. And I'm sure it can also be done with mini TE, and there are a lot of good options here. But I don't believe that we can still stick to general anesthesia with tracheal intubation, elderly, fragile patients. It has its own risks. We also have patients with uh, uh, liver cirrhosis, etc. We can never use this approach. Mm -hmm. So we have to think differently also for the future. So, so go for ice, go for micro GE, but go in a direction where we can be independent from the anesthesiologists. Yeah. Excuse me, sorry, I interrupted Sergio. So just after Christophe, if you, if you don't mind, after, after Sergio, sure. okay? Sure. Uh, uh, just, just a, a short comment. It is related with, the, with the, what uh, Jean Selig talked now. Uh, I have a comment regarding the cost. When, when, when you um, consider the cost, we have to evaluate the global cost of the procedure. So, uh, of course, there is an additional cost of the probe ice, but uh, with the TA, we have the additional cost of uh, uh, one physician for the anesthesiology and one, one nurse for in the anesthesiology team. One, the cost of an additional cost of uh, the physician for the, the TOE, so, and the um, cut lab turnover is lower. So we have to evaluate the cost globally. This is extremely important, because it's not, it's not only the cost of the, the pure cost of the probe. Yeah, sure, sure. It's, uh, no, no, I fully agree with what you said. And, uh, and then we need a cost-effective analysis. Uh, we need to... It might be a good thing, no? Just yeah, to yeah, do yeah. that analysis. Yeah, sure, sure. Christophe, you want to... Yes, I just wanted to, to, to summarize because what, what we are saying is the more pre-procedural imaging we have, the less imaging we need during the procedure. And if we have 3D pre-planning, we can do the procedure with 2D imaging, however, but the minimum requirement is to ex that it's... Uh, that we can exclude acute and long-term outcomes or complications, that we exclude DRTs, that we exclude peri-device leakages, and then we can, that we can ensure that the device is properly placed. And, uh, what if you, and if you don't have the pre-planning, that's what Ole said, then we need the 3D in the CAS lab. But it's easier to have it beforehand, and then we can use 2D eyes, 2D echo, whatever. Maybe 
I'm, I'm not sure about fluoroscopy alone, but um, yeah, a simplified uh, approach. I like very there's much. Again, uh, there's again, uh, sorry, there's again the other aspect. So, what are we recommend? Uh, what are the recommendations at the moment for the general uh, implanters? And uh, the second is, uh, what are we doing in the in the future? And do we have to look into the future? So, what Jens Eric is uh, recommending? So, we have to get rid of general anesthesia. Is this something we should recommend at the moment, or is it something we have to address in the future? So, how to how to so they don't want to get rid of the anesthesia. Yeah, that's it. So there are a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, But if you look at the volumes, it might be something which is necessary. So um, how should recommendations be but done at the moment? And the other thing is, uh, and I hope we will treat younger patients. So I don't think that we are moving to older patients. So uh, if it's a fragile patient, probably anesthesiolo the anesthesiology problem will be... Uh, a problem, but if it's a young guy, uh, young, 70 years old, and uh, it will be nothing to do a general anesthesia. So I, I think that we are moving to, we have a two different way. I'm really, I agree with both. I'm, uh, I will be very uh, happy to to move uh, away from uh, my anesthesiologist because I know that he, he, every week he asks me how many left heart manager you have to do, and so I want to have uh, at least one day that I can do alone in my cath lab. Uh, on the other side, I think that is uh, uh, it's cheaper, and uh, so I'm very I have some confusion. Probably this is a, this is okay. another thing that we can comment. I mean, in, in as the pre assessment seems clear, and the thing is the, during the mm. procedure, how do you assess the imaging? Yeah. So you can do different offers, and you can also suggest centers that you can get trained in that way. For example, if I need to go to train to mini TOE, I will ask Laura because I've seen her working and I, I trust the way they do and it's true that they talk while she's putting the probe in. And it's really something that probably if I need an echo guide training, I would. So we can suggest centers that have experience doing that if you yes. want to get trained in that or the other way. And this can be something helpful. Okay, let's, let's maybe summarize the, the session because we have to move to the another session. So I think you have heard very, very interesting things uh, from the audience and for a future consensus. First, I've heard that uh, there is a need for 3D imaging before, during, there is, a, there is a need for 3D imaging. I like very much the comment from Christophe that if you have 3D up front, probably you can work with 2D during the case. That's a super important. What we see here is that uh, we know from the, from the, uh, from the survey that uh, those modalities will stay. I mean, uh, there will still be in the future standard T, there, and, and people will move progressively due to the, the increase in the volume to more minimally approach and we have to teach them how to do it and what is the best, uh, even for classical T, I mean, uh, we, we need best practice, but also for the more mini-invasive uh, strategy, we need some guidance and some uh, best practice also. So I think that's the way to conclude this session and uh, thank you very much to everybody. <laughs>